Hey, welcome, welcome. So I hope you've had the chance to see Deli Man. And if you haven't, go out and see it. It's a wonderful film. And um, it is a sort of mouth-watering, Hamish show, warm and welcoming, wonderful film. And I think I gained 10 pounds just by watching it. And it's really beautifully done. And so we're just so honored to have, have Eric here um, as, the, as the director to sort of tell us about the movie and the story behind it. And, uh, and then Peter, you probably all know Saul's Deli. Peter Levitt um, has been running Saul's Deli for a long time. And I, I asked a little bit both about their backstories for introduction. And they started these stories and said, wait, 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 this is just too good. <laughs> I need to actually let you tell these stories rather than me try to, to smush it together. So the, the format is tonight um, that I'm going to be um, interviewing Eric and Peter and then taking some, uh, some, some questions. And, uh, and, and you, know, you, can, you can post a couple questions to smooth. We'll go for like for the first maybe 25 minutes or so as an interview. And in the course of the interview, I'll also pose some questions to them, which will be the prompts for the discussion that comes afterwards. Eric zooming in from New York so we're gonna, you know, he's gonna go after half an hour and Peter runs a deli. So we're gonna let him get back to work after half an hour. But after that, will come a time when we'll do sort of small breakout groups and share, um, and share some stories, um, which will be prompted by the discussion. So, uh, so taking it from there, uh, let me just start with Eric. First, Eric, thank you for the movie. And, um, and I gotta ask, everybody probably asked this, are you related to the pair? <laughs> not, not that I know of. Only, okay. in, only in my deepest Freudian substructure. I all right. So, so can you tell us? Um, I, I, I want to know sort of the backstory of how you came to make this movie. You've made lots of Jewish films, including one about the Klezmatics on Holy Ground, which was wonderful. Um, and could you talk a little bit about how you came to make this film and maybe tell us a little about your own background as a, as a filmmaker? Um, sh sure. I, so my background was primarily as a, as a fiction screenwriter and storyteller. Um, long story made very short. Um, I moved to New York in 1996 and really wasn't, um, you know, I was born in a Masorti, a Jewish family, north northern Philadelphia on on the, on the suburbs, and you know, was a bar mitzvah. And but aside from that, was kind of disconnected um, from anything remotely Jewish. I did it because I had to. Um, so Yiddishkeit was kind of in the air, but in a very opaque way. And it wasn't until I moved to New York, and I would prefer not to get into it, there was a, a family situation um, tragedy that led me to, to, to searching. Um, and you know, I've always felt myself to be Jewish, but in, in ways that are not necessarily unidentifiable. Uh, and um, when I was living on the Upper West Side, I stumbled into eventually a synagogue on West 88th Street, B'nai Jeshurun, that has a very kind of rich musical tradition um, and I'd never heard music as uplifting as that before in my life, anything close to it. And I ended up, um, I did some singing as a kid and I ended up trying out for the High Holy Days Choir and I'm a tenor, so tenors are popular. Mm -hmm. um, so I started singing in the choir and that led to a trip to Israel, um, my very first, which led to talking with some guy who is this really wealthy, retired plastic surgeon that gave up his practice to study cantorial music and then the rabbinate at, um, um, at Jewish Theological Seminary. And he heard me singing and he said, like, well, have you ever considered becoming a cantor? And I said, no, but something in the suggestion stuck. And I did ended up started studying cantorial music. Um, and it's through that journey that I met a guy named Jack Mendelssohn. So, I made a movie about this Chazan, um, Jackie, originally from Borough Park, Brooklyn. Um, that movie became A Cantor's Tale, which was distributed in 2005. And it became surprisingly, amazingly popular. We got a theatrical um, release for it, limited, um, great reviews in the New York Times and, and, and the Wall Street Journal. And the fuse was somehow lit 
within me to kind of investigate kind of Jewish stories, Jewish storytelling substrate. And I guess, you know, we're all kind of like, you know, you're everyone in your dream is that psychoanalytic thing says. I mean, so uh, through the films, I guess I'm investigating my own quarrels and connection with Judaism and always kind of at the core of it, it was this idea of, of tradition. You know, what makes us Jews? Why are we Jewish? Are we Jewish for, because we go to shul? Are we Jewish because we listen to a certain kind of like music or, you know, in Perkei Avot, they say the three keys are basically prayer, study and gemelut chasidim, you know, acts of loving kindness. So I guess there's all different ways that we can define ourselves as, as, as Jews and making documentaries was a process of, of, of study and, and adherence for me through this process. Um, one of my films about a band, a Grammy award winning band called The Klezmatics was actually screened in Houston. And the guy that, that sponsored that film was Ziggy Gruber, oh. who kind of like became the center of, of Deli Man. Like making a movie, especially documentaries, because they're so painstaking and you're always wrestling for funding. And it's, it's, it's not <laughs> a fun process always. And it's like running a marathon. Like after you run it, you say like, I'll never do this again. And then you meet something that inspires you and then you run your next race. So something in my meeting with Ziggy connected because he's such a interesting character, his own journey. I know that we're gonna hear a little bit about Peter's journey in a second, kind of like sparked me. So, and the story about Jewish delicatessen was similar in a way to the other stories I was telling, cantorial music or klezmer music, all these things that, you know, were popular, were synonymous with Yiddishkeit and now are kind of like falling by the wayside. So again, this wrestling match between modernity and tradition, what stays, what goes, why, who makes the decisions, et cetera, et cetera, all this kind of fed into the flume of, 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 of making Delhi Man. Oh, this is, which is like a great Jewish theme, wrestling with tradition. I know I saw um, Miracle of Miracles recently, the documentary about Fiddler on the Roof, and it's, um, you know, they, the, the, the play, as the musical didn't take off, they, they began with sunrise, sunset. And and there was something about it not working. And, and they asked, they said, what is this movie? What is this show about? And they finally realized it was about tradition. They said, write a song about tradition. So just that it's the tradition and the wrestling with tradition that um, that is the constant push and pull. And it's, it's, the, it's those who are Jews and those who are Jewish you know not quite I'm, I'm not really a jew i'm jewish it's that kind of that in between um well so let's let's go to you peter um i so first of all having beaten at Saul's many many times since i've moved here in the 80s um i wanted to know a little bit of your own backstory how how it is you you came to run Saul's, and then some of the some of the backstory of Saul's itself because i saw it on the website but i think most people don't know it so I'll start with uh, Saul's itself, just to. Uh, um, so apparently, Saul's the the the, um, the building was a produce store of some sort. At the time that there was an electric tram that ran by on Shattuck, and the station was the Safeway, the North Shattuck Safeway. Hmm. And there was a wrought iron gate that you pulled across the front, open or close every day. The, store, the produce store, low hanging light bulbs, and we found this in excavation when we did a remodel. Um, and it had a really interesting roof structure, a lamella roof structure, which is fairly rare. Um, so it was an interesting building. And um, it had been, a, the, the whole building had been dedicated to what was called the lunch counter uh, around 1950. And the Goldbergs ran the lunch counter. And uh, it had, it was kind of a Jewish lunch counter. And that went on until 1970, some mid 70s when David Rosenthal, a local lawyer, decided we needed a Jewish deli. Mr. Goldberg had passed away and he took it over. Um, but he divided it in half first, gave half to Baskin Robbins and he ran the Jewish deli in the remaining half. Um, and then he had a fire there in the seventies and his law practice had taken off. He didn't need to have a deli in his life. And so he, uh, uh, Andrew Lichtenstein, uh, uh, who had grown up, whose father from New York, who had grown up, her name was, his name was Saul, uh, decided to raise funds from uh, psychoanalysts and doctors and extended community of, of, of Berkeleyites. And so she, she bought Rosenthal's and kept it open and renamed it Saul's. And in 1985, in 89, uh, so she started Saul's in, 80, in 86. In 89, 
uh, right after the big earthquake in, 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 in the Bay Area, my partner, Karen Edelman, um, took a job that she decided not to commute on a freeway that had just collapsed, decided that was that, she's not commuting anymore uh, to work. And she walked into Seoul's and Andrew was in the office and she said, I wanna work as a waitress. And they looked up at her and said, you're Jewish, fine, you're hired, bye, start tomorrow. So Karen was a waitress at this restaurant and I was at the time um, cooking in, in mostly fine dining restaurants here in the Bay, uh, Olivero, Chez Panisse uh, and some others. And um, uh, and my, I think my career ended at Chez Panisse and then my career, ended my career as a line cook and went into teaching. So I was a middle school teacher also here, finishing up here in Berkeley. Karen was this waitress at Souls, and um, uh, there, there wasn't any on-site ownership anymore. Um, Andrew had left and left it in the hands of managers. And Karen and I wondered, you know, why isn't there, well, I wondered as a, as a fine dining chef, why isn't there a good Jewish delicatessen? Why aren't, why isn't Jewish cuisine looking at ingredients like everybody else is here in the Bay Area? Um, so looking at ingredients and the idea of, you know, uh, farm to table and the, the idea of organic ingredients uh, hadn't arrived in the Jewish deli movement yet, as far as we could tell, not in New York, not in Los Angeles, and certainly not at Souls. And um, I didn't even eat at Souls. I, you know, I wasn't impressed by anything I tasted there. I didn't know much of Jewish deli per se. And so this leads into my story growing up. Um, what I, I I, we, we, we could not escape from being Jewish in, in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg, which is uh, where I grew up. I grew up in, actually was born and grew up in the first seven years in Botswana, a country north of South Africa. And, uh, and then my parents moved us to, uh, from Francistown, Botswana to Johannesburg. Um, my mom and dad were both born in South Africa. My mom of a British German descent and my dad of Lithuanian. Um, my dad's story is a little interesting. There were five brothers three got in a pogrom, three got on a, on a boat to Chicago, two to land on a boat to South Africa. And never again did we ever find out who they were. I still to this day don't know who the American branch of, of my dad's, my grandparents, five, three brothers were. Uh, the two who got to South Africa died early. Uh, my dad grew up in an orphanage. Uh, my mom was of a relatively poor Jewish family. Um, they tried to make a living running uh, uh, tea shops in you know, motels on the road from Johannesburg to uh, Bulawayo in, in Zimbabwe. And so my mom had a slight exposure to deli or restaurants, uh, tea rooms in particular, hated cooking as a result, hated food as a result, hated dealing with people. And that's, that's the kitchen I grew up in. Um, and then the one particular Jewish food memory I have was Saturdays at home, she would always go to the local Jewish butcher, local Jewish bakery and get um, uh, cold cuts and some rye bread. And we had a bottle of schmaltz on the table and we would make uh, uh, sandwiches. And um, little did I know what that portended for the rest of my life. So we never knew corn, we never knew corn beef or pastrami. They were not part of our, our, our meats, but salami and, and the other cold cuts um, uh, were, were part of my, my Jewish eating experience as a kid, besides the holidays which we celebrated um, and besides going to the synagogue. Um, that, that Saturday lunch and the sh bottle of schmaltz on the table, never olive oil, never butter, um, uh, is a defining experience and moment. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so that being in South Africa and being part of the Jewish community, is a, there was a counterpoint. You always knew you were Jewish. There was a party going on. There was go, having good, for white men, you had to go to the army at the age of 17 or 18 to fight for an apartheid government against black people. Um, and so you're, you're constantly being reminded that you were Jewish, either from, you know, what's right from what's wrong, or the history being made all around you, um, and, uh, and from anti-Semitism everywhere. Uh, and then also just being surrounded by Jews. I went to a high school, even though it was a public high school, was more than 50% Jewish, and, uh, as was our suburb. And then we, I emigrated when I was 21, I left the country, I got on a plane, desperate not to return to the military because they had called me up again for a second year because the civil war was heating up. It was 1980, 10 years, 10, 11 years before uh, Mandela got released. Uh, and, um, made my way to California and remained here illegally for many, many years. Uh, and once I got established, I went to community college and transferred to Cal, got a degree at Cal, and then landed up in local restaurants. And so that was my path to Souls. Wow, which, which adds a whole level to the issue of illegal immigration, which is such a topic <laughs> these days. And, and we generally think of like migrants at the border 
And those of us in Berkeley aren't necessarily thinking of Saul's, but we will <laughs> now. But I will say that that as you're talking, the chat <clears throat> is going on and on about um, I had Saul's chicken liver sandwiches for dinner and having their blintzes now for dessert. So that's a complimentary protein there. And there's um, there's uh, and, and, and this you'll appreciate what Ronnie wrote. <clears throat> Don't tell my mishpucha, but the blintzes are as good as the ones made by my aunt Jenny, which is very good. And then, and then I'm very fussy about chicken liver since I think I make some of the best. But we'll try Saul's after so many recommendations. So it's it's pretty um, pretty impressive reviews. And then Dorit is um, is eating a uh, I think she texted a pastrami sandwich on gluten free bread, which I'm thinking is probably. Well, one of the points of the movie is, you know, where there used to be 15,000 delis just in New York or something on every corner. Now there are, there are 150 in the nation at the time of the film, which has changed again. Um, but I'll bet that the ones where you can get your pastrami sandwich on gluten-free bread pretty much limited to Saul's, unless I, I miss something. Um, so... So, so that's it's it's kind of just wonderful to to sort of hear both the the backstories. Um, Eric, can you talk a little bit about the reception of the film and sort of what's come of it as it as it's um as it's been shown? Um, I know you did an event here in Berkeley with the Klezmatics, yeah. Yeah, I mean the film. The, the, first of all, I mean we were a small documentary. I mean, you know, I think we we ended up delivering the movie. For something like three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, which is you know either for a documentary a documentarian that's you know scratching along and trying to make a ten or fifteen k movie, that's a lot. But by the standards of you know a Michael Moore film, it's 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 a drop in the bucket. So we got really like they say in the Torah, we well, give you this day a, a blessing and a curse. The the blessing was that we we got picked up for theatrical distribution by a company called Cohen Media Group. Mm -hmm. um, they're a specialty distribution company run by, you know, a billionaire real estate developer that's got kind of a taste for, for both great European cinema, but also he's got a real nish Jewish neshama. So because of our relationship with Cohen Media Group, we got a, a, a theatrical release, a nationwide theatrical release. I think we played in anywhere from 42 to 45 theaters and we were kind of like you know almost considered amongst the first 50 last 50 movies to be considered for an oscar that year um we got some great reviews kenneth turan of the los angeles time made us you know a pick of the week i, I think we played for five weeks theatrically at, at the lemley theaters so that side of the story was stupendous um the side of the story that i i wasn't as, as happy about is because you know it, it's going to sound like a complaint and i don't mean it as such and i don't mean to be so businessy in my my talk tonight but um you know like delis it's like yeah we gotta you gotta serve the best food possible but you also got to keep the lights on you know we filmmakers have to keep the lights on too so because cohen media group was really interested in, in the big bang they didn't spend enough time in elbow grease, kind of like working the Jewish Film Festival and the JCC and the community circuit. So in that way, you know, the, the fun part after you put all the, the, the work into the movie is going out and visiting these communities and schmoozing and showing up at film festivals and talking. And so that part of the process is a little bit lacking, you know, and because there was one guy at Cohen Media Group, he's, he's since left, Gary Rubin, he was the executive vice president, and he really had it right. Because, you know, the Cohen Media Group centered in the East Coast, they thought, you know, they're making Catherine Deneuve films. And mm -hmm. Deli Meat is not Catherine Deneuve. And de de delis are dirty, hard work, roll up your sleeves, up early in the morning, and, and you have to market and, and, and publicize the movie with that kind of like spirit. It's a granular type of thing. And Cohen Media Group wasn't interested in doing the deli man's work um, and distributing the film. So I, I don't think, even though on, on one hand, the movie reached a really wide audience, I think it could have done even better moving from community to community, 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 because what is the deli? The deli is, is the open table. It's the people where co people come to congregate, to mourn, to laugh, to share, to eat, to kibitz, to the whole th side of that. And that has to be kind of like built into the release platform of the, of, of the film. They didn't quite get that. 
So that was a bit of a disappointment, but it's like crying over spilt milk. A lot of people saw the movie, which is, is great. Yeah, and we're, we're just so glad you're joining us. That, you know, and I tonight pointed to several different people to see the movie and people have, have loved it. Um, they, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's questions coming up on the chat about whether Saul's has homemade matzah <laughs> and 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 the rush on it you know i i like an idiot showed up there on the night of Purim thinking oh i'll get some homentashen and, and they just they just said yeah right homentashen we have been like saying homentashen forever completely out um so 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 peter everybody wants to know can you yes. get matzah yes and <clears throat> just because i know people ask do you have to pre-order this matzah yes i would advise it all right and you we, are, we have a skeleton crew under COVID conditions um we don't know whether to plan for 50 percent of a normal passover or 150 percent and there's no way to just ramp it up to 150 percent because we have a skeleton crew uh so i would i would definitely uh um pre-order so so just to let people know they can go to the um the website and and pre-order there so folks yeah. that's your that's your um that's your your orders there and um and and some people are bringing up questions that um that we're going to ask and, and share with others oh there's the Saul's website in the chat saulsdelia.com um a, a question about who you think of you know it, it's it's as you said Peter it's the it's the people and it's the schmoozing it's the food it's not simply just a, a restaurant it's a whole community as you think of of people and of language you know i've heard from you from both of you a little bit of, of yiddish kite are there yiddish words that come to mind and are there particular people that come to mind that you associate with when you go to a deli and of course you have you have ziggy but but just maybe free associate just a bit on that eric are you asking eric oh uh, yeah ahead. let's go with eric i'm gonna disappoint you I mean, I didn't grow up. I mean, we, Delhi and, and my family growing up in Abington, Pennsylvania, we used to go to a place at the Baderwood Mall called Murray's. There was a Murray's and there was a Murray's too. That was our deli. So every Sunday was our kind of like eating out day. So one Sunday it was Chinese, and the next week it was deli. Then we went back to Chinese and we checkerboarded it. Um, you know, we ate the, uh, my favorite, I guess, was always pastrami, lemon and bologna, but it wasn't part of, you know, Personally, it wasn't part of my culture. Um, it was something that I was kind of like introduced to much later when I became a New Yorker. And then I started again investigating this, 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 this Jewish path. And, 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 and something lit up in me that the nice thing about Delhi, and I know this isn't the direct answer to your question, is that, you know, Delhi, there's so many arguments going on in the Jewish world, you know, about halakha, men canters, women, can, whatever the argument is. And almost the argument, there's certainly arguments about Delhi, but Delhi is ultimately kind of a happy platform to be landing in. It's a place that kind of like brings a, a smile to people's, there's memories, there's everything. I mean, so many, I, I, I think that probably, you know, Peter can talk to this better than me. We were, um, the last scene um, in, in Deli Man where, where Ziggy, spoiler alert, you know, where Ziggy is, is going to be at a synagogue for a very special occasion. <laughs> it's even not a spoiler because it's something, it's, even if you know it, it's something to, to just love when you see the film. So we met a guy there, David Popowitz, that was like, you know, like it's happened in a lot of communities, kind of like, you know, the Jewish areas were kind of maybe a little slummy or ghetto-esque and then they've been gentrified. So all of a sudden, kind of like the Jewish neighborhoods that have basically been bereft of Jewish culture are now being revivified in some shape or form. And this restaurateur, David Popowitz, is all of a sudden kind of like bringing back like Jewish cuisine to, to, to Budapest. Hungary has suffered its own horrible trail of, of anti-Semitism, which still exists today. And, you know, to hear like he's like this bodybuilder, 260 pound guy, 6'2", six, 6'3", six, talking about kind of like at his grandmother's and mother's kind of apron strings and remembering recipes and how he, she cooked this and blah, 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 and bringing that entire kind of like experience into his kitchen to recreate Jewish cuisine through his eyes and perspective. I mean, that's what, it's not a direct answer to your question, but in terms of kind of like what I associate with Jewish food, Jewish ambience, 
it's that it's it's kind of like how the personal story is so kind of like vivid and savory vis-a-vis -vis this experience we have with, with food and ultimately it, it's a happy experience you know we don't hear about kind of people <laughs> being beaten because they didn't show up to their bar bought mitzvah lessons you know deli food is happy it's, uh, I, I love, and it wasn't a direct question, so I didn't need a direct answer. I just love where you went with that. And the, um, you know, some people in the chat are saying, um, saying that, that, you know, wondering, do delis maybe stand in for relatives we don't have? There's something that's like this, this place of, of relating. And somebody um, in the chat also shared a, a story about being a theater director in New York, going for an interview, and they met in this deli with these huge sandwiches. So she was trying to interview while she was like trying to navigate this, um, this, this, this giant deli downtown sandwich. Um, I'm sure Peter could speak of it. I mean, you know, from Jay Parker at Ben's Best, from other deli owners, from the Bremer Brothers in Newark, you know, you hear these stories about people, you know, going through mourning, you know, and the place they come to after Shiva or for Shiva is, is the deli, or they're just about to go on a long trip and the last meal they have at the deli, or they're just landing at JFK and their first stop before returning home is the deli. There's something so um, resonant and, and comforting and uh, not just about the food, about the entire environment. It's about food, it's about storytelling, it's about memory, it's about relatives, it's about recipes, it's about my pastrami versus your pastrami. I see these chicken liver chats, you know, popping up in our in our chat thing, you know, it's like almost, Peter and I don't exist really. It's really a, a forum for people to kind of like talk about food and, and recipes and memory. So that's the deli. That's well, that that captures. And Peter, do you want to you want to go anywhere from that? With yeah, that's always been the function of the deli. You know, I've I've op operating the deli. I've had to struggle with the kitchen and struggle with the food, and and wrestle with the you know the menu that was too large and um and the the the, the portion lack of portion control with really cheap ingredients, which is what was what I always felt that you know is what hurt the deli, and this it's has been central to what I tried to do different in, in this, in my experience of this deli here in Berkeley. Um, but at the end of the day, no matter what, I, what my experience was at the front door, people were arriving, you know, whether it be from Hawaii or whether it just be back into town after a long time, or just arrived in town and bought a house in the neighborhood. So started to serve a function for each of those people, it's slightly different, but always comforting. And, um, so all of that rings true. I mean, that the deli ser has served that purpose. And the big question is how do you, as the context for Delhi changes, the economic context, the cultural context, and the population changes, how does it continue to serve that function on ongoing? And, you know, you see it in all the new Jewish delis that are starting up around the country uh, and locally, um, and whether they're having a dining room or not. You know, the, the, the Jewish food, the deli Jewish food, more and more exists without the dining room, without the comforting, the comfort of a booth, hmm. right? There's nowhere to go eat. You get the food somewhere, get it sent to your home, maybe, especially during COVID. Um, so there's, there are huge challenges to that, that sense of comfort. How does it continue into the, into the future? If you don't have a host stand and a comfortable booth and a, and a, you know, a, a foot dragging servo selling watches out of its waistcoat, um, <laughs> Uh, it, we, we don't know how the future looks but it's certainly challenged but but you've had um you've certainly made interesting changes at Saul's that i've seen in recent years because the truth is that when my kids were young they would um the Saul's was the place we would go to when we couldn't agree on where to go eat somewhere else and it was everybody's second choice so that's where when we ended up. But you've you've recently just just brought up this menu. I had like a deconstructed Sabah sandwich there, which is like an Iraq. I think it's an Iraqi sandwich with hard boiled egg. It was delicious. Right. And um, so yeah. So what, I think what's really moved moved Karen and I at Souls. Um, you know, firstly, there's the context of being living in Berkeley, the farmers market in Berkeley. We're in California, where ingredients are fabulous. Shea Panisse is around the corner. Um, and, and then, so there was, that was one prime mover, ingredients and the size of the deli. If you use good ingredients, you can have overstuffed sandwiches. The things don't go together. There's two things that are just in conflict. And, um, and so we made a philosophical decision to use acne bread, organic rye. We made, we made a philosoph philosophical decision to not use 
the cheapest meat you could find because that's the only path to a large overstuffed sandwich. This, this very movement in the description of Jewish deli food assumes, it must assume, you've used the cheapest meat you can find, the cheapest bread you can find. I know that sometimes hurts, but it's the truth. And, um, and then the other major moving factors for me were, was a trip to Poland, to Krakow, uh, Krakow, uh, Austria, and uh, Germany, um, where we saw, where I saw for the first time uh, the context for rye bread and, and dumplings and, and chicken broth and how it was in a living cuisine. So, you know, and then, I mean, there's a whole conversation about is the Ashkenazi cuisine an, a living cuisine? Very hard for it to be a living cuisine here in Berkeley. We have no, the context is, we've been removed from the context by, you know, great historical forces, geography, time. Um, and then a trip to Turkey, Istanbul, Israel, which just moved me, moved my whole world in terms of the underpinnings of a, a living Jewish cuisine. And it's in Tel Aviv, it's in all through Israel. And that brings together many, many cuisines through the Jewish experience, but especially the living part, the one that really is working through the Sephardic uh, uh, Israeli experience. So the, the, the Ashkenazis, you know, maybe, maybe in Meir Sharim, maybe on, on, in, in Jerusalem, on a Friday, especially, you can get some of the old classic Ashkenazi foods and they're living because that community eats and lives that food. But they're relatively tiny compared to the greater Jewish community. And they don't exist locally here in Berkeley. But the, uh, but the Israeli, the, the Arab Jew, the Sephardic Jew, that cuisine never got disconnected from their grandmothers. Their mm. grandmothers were able to continue cooking that food in Israel. The, the, the ingredients remained in connected it was existence still um, and so tasting food in Israel was a profound experience for me and seeing how the cuisine was alive and still fermenting I mean bubbling in the cauldron still working itself out and once you taste it you can't you can't ignore what you just tasted so a sabich in Tel Aviv was a, a profound experience for me um, and then the, seeing the rye bread in a, in a farmer's market uh, <clears throat> late summer, early autumn in, in Krakow was, was just mind blowing. Seeing latkes being cooked in these huge outdoor vats of oil um, because there's a living cuisine for Polish people, not Jewish in this instance. But I could see where my Jewish Ashkenazi roots came from and I could taste them in context. And um, so for me, the whole experience of Souls has always been about how do I get the menu to be small? How do I remain a deli for most of my customers? Give them the comfort of that menu and some of the many things that they kind of were expecting when they're thinking of coming to a deli. And then at the same time, how do I make the menu smaller? How do I do few, less things, do them, try to do them better and do them with better ingredients? And so there's this huge conflict of forces that have, that have, that have um, shaped my experience of trying to run sauce and made some enemies along the way. Got punched out almost once by a customer who didn't like a change we were making. Um, yeah, it never ends. The, you know, well, the, I, that conversation never ends. I got to say, I think you are you are succeeding in something that's not easy to do something that that does that, and, and that's that's my sense, and also it's confirmed from the the chat. People are talking about how much they love your latkes. Um, that both at Hanukkah and year round, and people are also saying how delighted they are that that um, the, 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 the all the cuisines of the diaspora are finding a place at at Saul's. And then somebody else was mentioning that their parents ate at Saul's two to four times a week until they died in their early nineties. So to be that community institution, and and that that is really something I know I I look forward to going there all all the time and that's the place to go schmooze about meetings and projects and things and booths are the place the place to sit i want to ask just one last question before you guys you guys go off um eric what what project are you raising funds for now what's your next documentary project that you're what would what I, I, I work on and how can people donate no <laughs> oh, thank you so much for asking that i also do want to before i, I go to i just want to actually speak to something with, with peter said but First and foremost, Parnassa. Um, for, for anyone that wants to get in touch with me, um, you can get me at Eric Greenberg Anjou at gmail.com or you can get in touch with me through through Dorit 
Um, the next Jewish project that I said I would never do again, but I am doing now, believe it or not, has to do with um, Jewish German circus dynasties in pre-World War II Europe, where um, Jewish circus owners and, and, and talent were basically the Elvises of their day. There was the golden age of Jewish circus that lasted from kind of like the end of the 19th century up until um, just after the end of World War I. There were some continuance to that, to that business and to that art, artfulness, but basically the ones that um, survived were murdered by the Nazis. So it's basically the untold story of these amazing Jewish artists that were crushed by Hitler. Um, so that's, it's, a, it's a fiscally sponsored program. Um, by the uh, National Center for Jewish Film at, at Brandeis University. So if anyone is interested in, in donating, um, it's a tax write-off and you're supporting Jewish culture and Jewish storytelling. So I invite you into our, our fold. What the a fascinating. These, oh. movies get the, these movies get out there and, and they do make a difference. Um, I also wanted to, to, to um, not to undersell myself, but I, I think Peter is talking about so many important things. And, and, and I think that you know, again, he's living this uh, yom yom um, in terms of kind of like making a business work against all different kinds of pressures. But it seems like the, the delis that are, are going to make it, I mean, if we could flash forward and see what our world looks like in 30 or 40 years, uh, is there going to be a place for Jewish deli? I mean, what happens to, 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 to all these people that like, you know, who savor the taste of pastrami or corned beef or rolled beef or whatever your kind of like poison pill is? You know, is there going to be the clientele for that kind of like food, you know, in another generation? And if not, is there going to be such a thing as Jewish deli? So when we talk about Jewish deli, I think we talk about the meat. We talk about the kitchen food, you know, the soups and uh, um, latkes, whatnot. And then, like, I think the third component is, is and then kind of like what Peter is, is looking into, I know Ziggy does it. I know the, the guys at Y Sons are doing it. It's kind of like, know your audience, you know? What does your audience kind of like respond to? Um, are they cutting edge? Do they need something more traditional? Is there room for all different kinds of things on the menu? You know, in the movie, you know, Jay Parker, Ben's Best talks about, look, you know, lungs, lung and heart stew, you know, that, that's not gonna be on our menu anymore because no one's ordering it. I mean, even at Second, Second Avenue Deli, they took chicken fricassee which is kind of like for so long, which was like a standard, but there weren't enough people ordering it. So it has to go away because the cost efficiency isn't there. So there's so many things that are kind of like ensorcelled into this process of who's gonna survive and who by fire and who by sword. I mean, I can't wait to, Peter, I can't wait to see you in Berkeley. I'll hopefully be out there this summer. I was, I was there for at Saul's like maybe 10 years ago, but I, I look forward to eating your food and, and I wish you all the best because what you're doing is holy work. This is, Thank you. well, what a pleasure it's been talking to both of you. And I, I'm very excited. And, and there's people who are very excited about the, the Jewish German circus film, which reminds me of like the classic old story was the, when the Nuremberg laws came around, there was a, a, a Jewish man who just couldn't find work. There were so many and, and he found only, the only place he could find work was in a circus to, and to go wrestle a live bear. But he had to feed his family somehow, and they was told he would go wrestle a live bear. And he thought, "What can I do? I, I, I can make, I can do another work." So he goes in to prepare to end his life, and and he, uh, and and like he goes in the ring, there's this ferocious bear comes up, starts growling at him, and the poor Shlomazel realizes he's gonna die. And he says, "What anybody Jew would say, the Shema, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu," and the bear says, "Adonai Achad." <laughs> And he looks, at, he looks at the bear and says, you're Jewish? And the bear says, what makes you think you're the only Jew looking for work? <laughs> well, what a pleasure it's been talking to both of you. And I just wish you both the best in the, the career. I thank you for making this movie that, um, that, really, that really feeds us. It nourishes us in a, in a great way, Eric. And I thank you, Peter, for literally and figuratively feeding us and nourishing us at Saul's, Saul's Deli. So Thank you. you had your warning, folks. You get your matzo order in surly. Well, are, are the other orders, other Passover dishes too? Yes, the full, everything the you'd full, need. The, the, the whole state of table. 
the whole set of tables. So, so, but place your orders early because they are running on a skeleton crew, and we got to let them know how much how much uh, zoftic that skeleton should be. So, we're going to let you go, and we're going to switch to gallery view to see people, or not switch to gallery view, but take care, be well, and right. uh, next year in uh, Berkeley. Okay. <laughs>